Hello, everyone, and welcome to the seventh Global Moment Gallery exhibition. My name is Mainimoe Ten Mingjo, and I am delighted to welcome you to this session. Today, we are going to have photo exhibition from four amusing photojournalists from two continents, that is Africa and Asia. We are a group of 73 photojournalists from 55 countries spanning 16 time zones, individually selected by the US Embassy in each of our respective home countries. We are participants in a special uh, initiative of the US Department of State's International Visitor Leadership Program, call it IVLP. The IVLP is now in its 82nd year. The special initiative is called Global Moment in Time, and our group of photojournalists is one of the three projects within the initiative. The Global Moment in Time initiative is offering the first ever long, uh, year long IVLP programming with a visual component in the fall of 2021 and an in person component in the fall of 22, uh, 2022, specific, uh, specifically in October. In between uh, is the bridge program, allowing us participants to work uh, to continue to grow and deepen our relationships with one another and a wider audience. Uh, these uh, global moment uh, gallery exhibitions are part of that opportunity uh, for us to connect with each other and with all of us through our work. We welcome you here today, and for some housekeeping rules, we are going to hook up uh, with our British builders, Bonnie and Brittany, who are next door with us. Hello, Brittany. Hello, uh, Bonnie. Thank you so much, my Nemo. Uh, in addition to being our moderator for today's Global Moment Gallery, my Nemo Mengjo is a photojournalist on the program from Yaoundé, Cameroon. He is also a filmmaker, freelancer, teacher, and mentor, as well as being a reporter for the leading English newspaper in his country, The Post. He uses his positive attitude, as you might see, and tireless energy to encourage others to work hard to succeed. We are so glad to have them on the team. I am Brittany Link, and along with my colleague, Bonnie Beard, we have the deep pleasure of being the bridge builders over the course of this year for this very impressive group of photojournalists. As summer comes into full swing here in the United States, we recently and sadly hit our one millionth COVID death. Though it sometimes feels so far away, we still remember that COVID is with us. Today, we'll be stepping back to some of those early days during the pandemic when photojournalists around the world were sharing pictures from all over of what was happening in their countries. At that point, they had no idea what was coming. Uh, they had no idea if they were put, how they were putting themselves at risk, and they were. So we will be able to see their photos from the front lines and hear the stories behind them. As always, I like to say we owe so much to our journalists and our photojournalists, and we always honor your work and your sacrifice. As we start today, I will also mention that though this is a U.S. Department of State sponsored program, the views expressed by the IVLP participants in this exhibition are their own and not necessarily those of the U.S. government. Thank you. Over to you, Bonnie. Thank you, Brittany. We are so excited to see you all. This is our, what are we, our eighth, our eighth exhibit, I think, at this point. We've got a couple more to go and it's great to see some new faces and some familiar faces. We've got friends and supporters. We've got a couple of people here that you that our journalists are going to meet with later, which will be really fun on the bridge and hopefully in person. But a couple of housekeeping things for you. If you haven't already changed your name, would you please rename yourself with your name of choice and perhaps the city or state that you're coming in from or country? Please stay muted until called on. We will do Q&A. You can put a question in the chat. You can raise your hand. We will ask you to speak it. You can send a note privately and we will call on you separately. But um, we greatly welcome your interest, curiosity, and questions. Today's presentation is being recorded, so for your awareness. And transcription, I believe, is also on. So with that, I pass it back to you, Manamo. The show's yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bonnie. Thank you very much, Brittany. 
Uh, we kickstart our session this day from a very peculiar point, particular point where we are going to have a welcome to my world, a short video. And of course, it is going to be Daniel Ijera, who is from or who is based in Asuncio, Paraguay. He is an art director and documentary filmmaker uh, of Jean and uh, a media outlet of Nation Media. He is 35 years old, working in uh, media since uh, 2006. Let's stay tuned and watch. Well, hello guys. This is Danny from Asuncion, Paraguay. I want to show you my world in 60 seconds. I'm going to show you a local cafe, which is called uh, El Café de Acá. The translation will be local cafe and I'm going to show you a traditional brunch. That's my wife right there. Well, we're going to start with uh, chipa cuatro quesos, which is some sort of yuca starch bread with four kind of different cheese. And then we can continue with mandi o shiriru, which is fried yuca with eggs and onions and cheese. This is just great. And then we can continue with something called bedu, which is yuca starch with cheese and butter. And we're gonna finish with something sweet called grandma dessert, a old school dessert that has fried dough with cream inside. Well, I wanted to show you my world. I showed you my food, which makes my wife very happy and makes me very happy too. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jara. That is very, very beautiful. Well, the, it was challenging, you know, to show your world in 60 seconds. So uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know, I don't know if it's better, but it was much more fun to show what what I eat <laughs> and what we eat, what we usually eat on brunch. And also, I uh, shared it with my, just with my phone and edited it with my phone too, because uh, currently I'm working on a project right here on, on, the, on, on Gen, which is uh, the place where, where I work. We're working on a project uh, with, um, with, a with a photojournalist, with a journalist, no, the photojournalist, just with the journalist that uh, sometimes they need to um, document a situation, they need to document something and they need to do it right and uh and with the uh, they, they need to be really close with what's more um you know perfect in uh, technically speaking with the video and the photographs so we're working on that and to see if they can edit it and and, and work with the video and the photographs in their phones and also to see if like in very short minutes they can and seconds they can tell you a story and if the to see if the storytelling is working very well and if can if you if, if that can deliver to the the people who's watching it so uh i also used this video like a small project to show the guys and see if we can do something very similar uh for the project here in at my work Hold on. Thank you very much, uh, Jara. That's very interesting uh, to know uh, the credible, uh, a good job you are doing out there. So, like I said, uh, we are going to kickstart uh, our first get uh, to get to our first presenter of the day. Uh, we take a quick stop at uh, in Conakry, uh, Guinea. Uh, that's in the African continent, where we are going to meet uh, Yusuf Ba, who is a freelance cameraman and a photographer in Guinea. He has worked with Al Jazeera TV since 2009 and with Associated Press since 2010. He is married with four children, two sons and two daughters, uh, one who is adopted. Uh, Yusuf has covered uh, the rebel war in Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, Mali, and Guinea-Bissau. He has, he has also been a front uh, line photographer in Guinea in both the 2000 and 14 Ebola outbreak and the current COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, Yusuf, the floor is yours. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for introducing me and for giving me this great opportunity to live my life, uh, to be part of this team. Um, to start with, uh, of course, you, have, you already said it, so let me just go straight to my picture. Um, if you see this old woman, she's the first COVID patient in Guinea. Um, the photo shows after she was discharged from the hospital with grandchildren. 
And when COVID came began in Guinea, people don't believe in COVID because um, in fact, here they were saying COVID is a white man disease. They said the white man brought COVID to kill the Africans. That is what most of the locals were saying. They said, no, the white man bring the COVID to kill us. So they don't believe. People thought that when Ebola came, they said it was bad and up to now people are eating bad. So this old man is coming from the forest region where um, you were having Ebola in those days. And so when she came to Conakry and there she got the virus, the COVID virus, and then she was taken straight by the Alima Health Center, the Alima Medical Officer, that's an NGO. They took her to the Donka, where, Donka Government Hospital where she got her treatment. And after when she came, she was ignored by most of the people because being that she was the first patient and after when she got well, if you see this photo, it's only the grandchildren that she was seeing around this old woman. Even our own child, our own children were not coming close to her because of um, the way the news, you know, it was very scary in those days when you have of COVID. So everybody was scared coming close to this woman. That was why we always say the children were at risk and they were the one responsible to give the elders again the COVID because like this woman, old woman, you see all the children very close to this woman. No adults, nobody. So when these children move from this old woman, going to play with other children, other children will run away from the woman. And this man you are seeing at this photo is a doctor who was working with Alima. He was the one testing the blood of coronavirus. And then when they get test your blood, he was the one that will test your blood and send the result out to the government. And then they will publish the result that this person has COVID. So he was the guy that tested the whole woman at the Alima lab in Conakry at Donka Hospital. So this is the man you are seeing right in front. And this ambulance, you are seeing police ambulance carrying three dead bodies. Um, these people died on the streets and everybody was scaring, saying that these people were having COVID. But when COVID came in Guinea, actually in the early days, when, when, when you die, we have no opportunity. The government has no opportunity to check whether that person to do post as we said in English word, to do post whether or not the person died from COVID. But these were people who were recognized by their family that they were getting fever and they were panicked and then they always go out to the streets. And some of these people were the one sharing the corona to the general public, and they died from the streets, and they were taken by security. And this photo, you will see the US ambassador on the right and members of the US embassy um, coming to receive the first COVID vaccine given by this US government. Uh, of course, let me say thank you to the United States government for helping us because we all get some of these who got the vaccine and they save our life. So this picture is showing at the Conakry International Airport at the VIP hall, uh, where VIP visitors are where you have the US ambassador and members of the UNHCR, uh, United Nations and other government officials um, at the airport waiting for the vaccine to be delivered to the Guinean government. This is the COVAC team. This team comprised, you will see the US ambassador, the French ambassador, the United Nations rep, all of the actors who were at the airport. At, at the back, you will see the plane when they came to receive the vaccine and after handing over to the Guinea authorities and to people to get the vaccine. So this was the time we get the first vaccine in Guinea. And um, if you see inside this truck, they are of unloading the vaccine inside the truck to take them to the health center where they will distribute to each hospital and start giving vaccine to people. So this was the first vaccine that came to Guinea um, in the early days when we get the vaccine. If you see, this is the national stadium. After when we received the vaccine, you will see a very big poster saying that from the 7th of May, 2021, we start giving vaccine. So there was a big campaign for the vaccine. So we were going out, taking pictures, although it was very scary to go out, but however, we have no choice. We have to tell the people the reality about COVID. We have to tell people to get the vaccine so that 
we can fight corona. So some of these uh, images we are taking by them, we use them into the local media, we explain to people, and people were ready. This was the time when people were ready to accept the vaccine, although it was not easy, but with the help of the international partners, um, that was the time. So okay. if you see, this is a demonstration, a political rally in Guinea Conakry. People don't even wear masks. Although the government was trying to talk to them, but people don't wear masks. People, you look at the picture, you will count how many people wearing a mask at this particular rally. It was very, very difficult. This was the time the chain was, the number of cases was rising in Guinea. Because the number of cases was rising, nobody wear masks, nobody wants to wear masks. People said they were suffocated in the mask. And after, because of the Chinese, when the case was in China, we started getting masks from China. In fact, most of these youths were saying, these are used masks from the Chinese. They are sending it to Africa, and they believe that most of them are getting the coronavirus from most of this vaccine coming to China. So people were actually reluctant to use um, the vaccine. And if you watch this picture during the same rally, you will see there is a protest clashes between security forces and uh, protesters. We, the cameraman, you can see us at the back. You only see one great man, journalist wearing a mask. Everybody in this photo, you will not see anybody wearing a mask because people don't even believe, even when we are talking to people, put on the mask. If you are not putting it to protect yourself from COVID, maybe this can help you from the tear gas they are firing. But people refuse. It was a very, very difficult time in those days when the early days of COVID began. Then if you look at this, this is May, uh, September 5th, when the junta overthrew President Alpha Conde in Guinea. Just look at these pictures. You will only see two people wearing a mask. These are the only two commanders. All the junior officers refused to wear the masks. They thought that they can get corona from masks. And some even believe corona was not true reality. So nobody, none of them put on the mask because even their leader in that, on that particular day did not put on a mask when he was talking to the general public. And some of these cases make up to now as I'm talking to people who are not wearing masks. So it was a very, very difficult time at this particular moment. And now yeah. the case of coming up. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. The pictures are just uh, cute, excellent. And, and uh, if I look at your pictures, I, uh, I have one question, just it's, it's a question for you. How can you, you know, describe your journey from the, uh, the uh, during this pandemic period, your uh, work and everything? Briefly, uh, how can you describe your journey? Um, I will first of all uh, say thanks to my family, uh, my children, uh, and friends who gave me the zeal to continue the job. It was very difficult. It was not a very easy journey. It's like. Um, it's like you are walking on top of the fire because that journey we are talking about is so scary. So scary. It was so scary. It was not easy. Um, but we fight it because there was no option. So the journey was very, very, very difficult. My brother, it was very difficult um, to do the job. When you think about the family, you have children, and you have to be front line to travel. Um, not that we are not making any money. It's like at that particular time, I was like a humanitarian photographer because there was no pay for that. So said, share the message. When you share the message, you save thousands of life, millions of life. It's better than you become rich because you pay food is more better. So it was really not a difficult journey. Uh, because of the time, I cannot talk more. I have more to say, but time limits uh, maybe when we meet we we'll talk about that before but the journey was not really easy journey it was a very difficult journey and up to today we are still on the journey thank you very much son we uh, we stopped over in uh, Jordan to meet uh, Salam Makawi, uh, who is a professional photojournalist based in Amman, Jordan, uh, covering news across the Middle East. He was a, a, a contracted contributor to Getty Image for more than 20 years and has lately joined uh, Al Mam uh, Al Lakar TV website, working on news features and photo essays. As a freelance journalist, Salah witnessed and covered uh, assignments for uh, publications like the New York Times, the Guardian, 
uh, Daryl Spurgeon, and more. He regularly provides images for governing and non governmental uh, institutions like the European Union and the United Nations. Salah has led a number of uh, photojournalist training for young journalists. He reads and speaks fluently English, Greek, and Arabic. Hello, Salah, over to you. Hello, Minimo. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let's uh, go direct to the photos. Uh, during the epidemic, uh, many strange things uh, were happening and many uh, scenes were uh, available for uh, photojournalists to, to see uh, when they, like me, who, who I was, I, I was uh, turning around all the time, all the day, uh, in Amman, my city and other cities all around the, the country uh, to find how is, how are things going on. Uh, in this picture, uh, this elderly woman was uh, making bread uh, an old fashioned uh, method uh, just because finding uh, bread or finding finding uh, bakeries open was something difficult in a stage or the, in the beginning uh, of the lockdown. Uh, the medical staff here, uh, I went to a hospital after uh, trying to arrange for many times uh, with them uh, to see how are things going on inside the rooms uh, with the patients uh, affected with the, the COVID. Uh, they allowed me after uh, being uh, inside there, uh, I mean, they were working for 30 days there. And they allowed me to take this picture only and uh, portraits of uh, every one of them, but not, uh, they did not allow me to uh, go further uh, to reach to see other people. Uh, those workers were helping, uh, providing food, uh, and other uh, aid to, to people who came, came back to Jordan uh, and those makeshifts uh, were made especially for them in an open area at the uh, Dead Sea uh, to host them uh, for 14 days before they were able to, uh, to reach out to their families. Uh, uh, here's a 17 years old uh, Jordanian boxer. Uh, he's an Olympic uh, boxing champion. Uh, he got his medal after this, uh, his gold medal, I mean, uh, after this uh, essay I made. He was, tra he was training at home uh, using Zoom. With, uh, with his coach and uh, actually with his uh, brother as well. Uh, it was strange to, to be uh, training on Zoom. The first day of, of a school, uh, this small child, uh, uh, I, I think Sarah, yeah, Sarah was, uh, was six years old. So was, her, her first day at school, she was shocked, not only because it was the first day uh, and her family will leave her, but also uh, she was shocked with everything going around, uh, hygiene, uh, masks, uh, tension everywhere. Uh, I think it was uh, a strange experience for, for uh, those children. Uh, in this village where I went, uh, Ahmad uh, is a pupil who, who was trying to find the signal, the internet signal to uh, follow up with his, uh, with his teacher uh, as online learning was a must, but uh, 
there was uh, no under construction for uh, for such a thing in all the country. Uh, chaos. Uh, it, it can be displayed. Can be said on the this way. I think uh, this scene is uh, tens of, of people coming from both sides of a bakery, just trying to get bread. Uh, we can go to the next, please, if you like. Uh, I went with uh, Dr. Fadi Abukran team uh, in the Jordan Valley. Uh, he was one of uh, the previous, maybe, uh, people I, I saw. Uh, he was uh, going from a village to another uh, using his car. Uh, he, it was damaged, really. His car, uh, he, he was paying from his pocket to go uh, from a, a home to another to find people to check, uh, to, to make the, uh, the PCR tests. Uh, he left his family for uh, more than a month. Uh, he was not seeing them. He has a, uh, a little child. Uh, who, who was uh, in contact with her only uh, from away, from, from like uh, meters away. Uh, one of the uh, isolated uh, villages, I went, I tried to, to enter the village. I was stopped there at the, uh, uh, at the police and, and uh, military uh, point. Uh, I, uh, I was lucky to see uh, an ambulance coming out from uh, the village, uh, but I wanted to show here that uh, isolated villages what, uh, was, uh, was something uh, happening from uh, a week to another. Uh, Jordan was the first country to uh, vaccinate refugees at their camps, and uh, the Zatari refugee camp for uh, Syrian, uh, for Syrians or for Syrian refugees uh, that hosts uh, hundreds of, of uh, thousands of uh, refugees was the first uh, to offer this for refugees. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salah. Very amazing and great pictures there. And, uh, uh, you really took great shots. Uh, just a question, uh, a question for you. Um, what were some of your, uh, your your take home messages when you were, uh, you know, taking those pictures during this COVID? What was the take home message? Uh, were you not afraid? Were, the... were you not afraid of being? contacted or having the, uh, the disease or the virus, what really was in your mind? Were you? To be honest, afraid not, not for myself. Uh, but I was uh, uncertain for, uh, for, not for anything. So I was afraid to, to bring uh, the virus to my family or not even to my family, to others who even I don't know. If I uh, go and work with, with people and some of them is infected and uh, pass the infection to me, I, I was afraid to pass it to another. I was not afraid for myself. It's, I, I mean, it's the, uh, it, it's the feeling of the, of the photojournalist. Uh, you, you don't think about yourself because you just feel that you are, you're working, you are, you are, uh, trying to to uh, to show uh, your work, to to give the the message to people. So the fear is the fear is not for yourself, but for the others. Uh, so, what is the situation now in Jordan? Well, it is uh, great. Uh, we were doing very well from the beginning, really well. But in a point, there was some uh, uh, some faults, some uh, things happened that 
things did not uh, go all the time as uh, there was in, uh, in the beginning. In the beginning, we were really good. Thank you very much. We our next stopover from Malaysia, where we are going to meet uh, Afif Abdul Alim. Hello, Alim. Hello. Thank you. And Thank you, Mani Mano. Yes, welcome. Uh, Afib uh, Abdul Alim is based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Afib uh, Alim has been actively involved in photography and photojournalism uh, since 2008. He has been a, a stringer for uh, Agence France uh, Press, that's AFP, since 2010, and is currently a full time photojournalist with the Malaysian Insight. Uh, many of Afif Abdul Alim's photographs uh, have been published in international media, uh, including CNN, Forbes, The Guardian, The National Geography. Uh, his exhibits have covered the Malaysian airline flight, MH370 uh, tribute, uh, the Pantheal Tumor post flood relief, and more. His uh, extensive experience has honored him with the uh, Magnum Photos uh, Scholarship uh, for a Working uh, Photographer Workshop. Uh, 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 Alim, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, everyone, for um, being here tonight. Uh, I will start with my first photograph here. Uh, is during lockdown here in Malaysia and pandemic where everyone cannot uh, work. Uh, only only few sector have been open for working, which is uh, F and B. Okay, this uh, woman is uh, I made uh, I do photo essay for these stories. She's the one who just uh, lost uh, her job this night because she's uh, working uh, as a daily salary in the restaurant. Uh, and then uh, yeah, so my 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 my. My photo essay on this is I'm looking for people who lost their job and place to stay during pandemic. So I do three months and a half for this project. So this is the first uh, person that I met and then uh, can next one of them. And I focus not just on the local, uh, I focus on the foreign uh, people who work in Malaysia as well. And this guy uh, on the caption, we can see he's the one who worked in the hotels uh, area in Malaysia. Also, uh, lost his job uh, due to the pandemic because the hotel cannot sustain anymore. Uh, next, next photo, please. All right, uh, and this is the mother of four. Uh, I made uh, during my photo stories uh, on the street. This is the house that she stayed. Uh, not the house actually. This is the room that she stayed. Uh, she stayed with the four of uh, kids. Uh, the day I met her, this day she have to pay the house uh, like a uh, daily rate, uh, Malaysian ringgit, thirty ringgit uh, per day. So the day I met her, she can't afford to pay the house for more than three days already, and the owner asked her to move out. So I follow her to the house, then I see all the kids. I try to help as much as I can. I can't like really pay a lot as well. So all right, next. And these two is an Indonesian uh, work, a worker who worked at a restaurant here in Malaysia. Uh, they have the house before, but then they have to be homeless because uh, they, are, they, have, they stopped working and then the, they can't stay anymore in the hostel they used, used to stay. And their, their flight ticket is, uh, they can't fly out that time is locked down in Malaysia. So out of nowhere, they become homeless here in Malaysia for more than six months. Yeah, all right, here is a drone shot. Uh, when the case, this is not uh, from the story just now because the story just now is more, I, I have a 13 photos, I just put four here. And this is the day where the, the massive uh, that I stayed here in Malaysia. So I just, just photograph as this to show uh, the ambulance more than this actually. So they put like in the morning and the evening session. All right, next. This is the earlier stage of COVID here in Malaysia where when I know that the most uh, uh, affected people is the 
old man. So I go to the some uh, old folk house, which is not like the expensive one, which is the one that if you can see from the photograph, the pampers and everything, and the 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 or the caretaker he only used like the cheap one to sanitize the place. So I used I managed to get into this place to photograph it because in the beginning everyone are lost in the story. We don't know what's gonna happen during this COVID issue things, right? All right, next. This is uh, the place uh, uh, where, I mean, this is the, the hospital, the one that the, the, they're going to handle the COVID uh, dead body. So it's like a war zone here. All the equipment are really not, they used to manage the cops or what. Yeah, so I managed to get into the hospital uh, to photograph this. This is all the equipment that they use to, to, to handle the COVID patient dead body. Next. All right, so when the section in Malaysia they've been locked down, uh, the other issue come out, which is uh, the foreign workers who work here, they can't go to renew their permit. So when they lock down that area, the police officer and the immigration and custom and all, they, they will go into the place. So when uh, this come the issue when th these people are actually uh, legal here work in Malaysia, but they can't renew because they can't go, they can't go to, they can't go to renew because it's locked down. But then they've been taken by the officer to, to the, the I, I'm not call, I mean like lock up, you know? Yeah. So it's sad, sorry. I mean, their, their employee have to go and settle everything, but it's locked down. Yeah, next. This is the earlier stage when the case is high in Malaysia. And then the hospital, this is a library in the hospital where the department are not handling the COVID patient like a dentist and everything. They bring all the staff to come and to come and stitch the PPE because the PPE stock is run out in the hospital. So the other department and they, they're willing themselves, uh, they turn out the library into the stitching area of the PPE in the general hospital in Kuala Lumpur. Next. Oh, this is the area where it's like totally locked down, like the announcement just do like 24 hours, just like that. And we can see around here, all the, all the like, all the rubbish around here is really like just totally left just like that. And the army control the area. I think there's the last photo, right? Yeah. I can't hear you my anymore. I think you mute. Wow, that's great, Alien. Uh, your pictures are really very uh, uh, good. Great shots there from you. Thank you. Um, Yes, I, I've been going through your pictures one after another. And um, I feel like I should, you know, ask you this particular question. Uh, during this period, you went out, you were doing, I know it was not easy doing your work, but the two at one moment came back home, so disappointed that you did not capture exactly the same, the, the, the picture that you needed or the, the moment that you needed during this pandemic. So, sorry, I, I don't get it. I want to know whether at one moment you came back very disappointed that you did not capture the picture that you needed to capture. Okay, uh, that's a good question. But uh, my name when every time I go out, especially when I do my photo essay on the pandemic make us homeless, just now that I shared the first four, I really go without any expectation because I have to be with them as a homeless. Uh, I only can share you, it's not about in terms of photography. I just noticed that one fine day because I live here in the apartment here in KL. Got one fine day when I, in the elevator at my house around 2 a.m. in the morning, I really like lost myself, you know, like because I'm be with that. They are not homeless before. They just turned into homeless during this pandemic. So when I come in home, uh, when I be, I have to be with them to know their real story I, because I cannot, I cannot take the story just like, I don't want them to be like, they cheat on me. Uh, they are really homeless before. Uh, I have to figure it out. They are really homeless. Bef uh, I mean, they are not homeless before. They have work. They have place to stay. So when I come home, because when I be with them on the street, they are really like, don't know what to do. You know, like, where are you going to pee? Where are you going to shower? They are not homeless before. So I, I can feel them because when I'm coming back home at my house, I just really feel like what, what, what if I 
I can be like them. Well, what can I do, you know, on the street? Where, where should I shower? Where should I go pee? Or where should I go, you know, do my business? I, I, I really, I really, yeah, that, that, that's the thing I bring home. I, I don't think much about my photograph that time because I really go for the story first. I know the photo will come. Either it really come or not, I, I just go first. I, I don't think much about either I get a good photograph or not. I, I think because of the story there, I, I just hold my pandemic make us homeless first, the story first. Thank you very much, Adil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll take... Manamo, there's one question in the chat. Um, oh. What triggered you to do this specific photo essay, Alvin? Okay, uh, because when when in Malaysia, uh, I, I go every day during this COVID COVID era. I mean, I go out every day with all the colleagues here. Sometimes, and sometimes I go alone. And then I start to meet someone on the street. When I heard, I hear his story. Actually, he sleep in the car with the cats. He has seven or nine cats. I can't remember. He sleep in the car, and then I talk to him that time at night. Why are you sleep in the car? And then the story come out, you know? Like he said, uh, I have a house before. Uh, I have uh, my daily salary and so on. And then I lost the house because the pandemic, the, they can't work anymore. Since then, I, I used to play chess with him on the street. So I know that if that story come out one person, sure, we have another one. And then I start to structure my story on that. I start to structure either I need to follow on him or... I should, what happened to the foreign workers here in Malaysia? What happened? And then I start every night, I go out uh, around nine because around nine, that time in Malaysia, KL will be silent because people cannot go out. So I know whoever on the street, sure, they don't have a place to stay or to, to sleep. Then I start to talk to them, but I, I, I've been cheated as well. Some of them talk, I mean, they are really humble, they are drug things, so, you know. But along the way, I managed to get the, 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 the right one for my work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aline. Uh, Thank you. From, yes, from uh, Jordan uh, to Guinea, uh, uh, Conakry to Malaysia. Now we are going to take another flight to uh, Nigeria where we are going to meet Kule Ogulfeyi. Hello, Kule. Kule Ogunfeyi is an award-winning uh, Nigerian photojournalist and document uh, tree photographer. He is currently with this day newspapers at the online uh, as the online photo editor. He has been a photo stringer for the Associated Press, Glo uh, Global Photo Associates, uh, Arise Magazine, and other local and international agencies. Beginning his career as a freelance community photographer in Lagos. His work has covered notab uh, uh, notably uh, events in Nigeria, such as the oil subsidy protest, Boko Haram, politics, and cultural events like the Abuja Carnival. His work has evolved beyond capturing moments. Uh, Gunfeyu uh, believes everything is possible once you focus and work towards the end. Hello, Kunde. The floor is yours. Hi, Mami. Thanks very much. Uh, let's just go straight to the image, images for today. Here is the uh, Lagosians uh, writing their names down for the government subsidy. You know, immediately after the lockdown, people were not going out, people were not sure about what to, how to go about the pandemic. Then there was shortage of food. And after some time, the government started bringing, introducing some palliative food bags. So here you have people in Nigeria, me, federal and local government coming together to pen down their names to collect the government um, food subsidy as a means of a palliative for, to keep the family going. Let me. Here again is uh, um, the, the there's a team of private sectors in Nigeria. They came together in partnership with, uh, uh, with the government. Uh, they were called CACOVI. They were a coalition against COVID-19. You have the rich guys in Nigeria, the private sector, the banks, individuals. They came together. They must have fund, put funds together to s support the uh, government initiative uh, to um, uh, provide food, daily food to 
some people who can afford food during the lockdown because most average Nigerians live on a daily uh, daily wage. So when you have lockdown that is span that is span for about three months, that actually weakens their financial strength. So getting uh, food as common as bread became difficult. So you have Kakovi coming in to supply food to local government. He has one local government in Lagos as well that is government, a uh, private individual came in. You can see here in the top image, this is another local government. It's called uh, a fellow local government where you have residents in that local area coming to the local government to take palliative, government palliative. That's what the woman is carrying on her head going home. Here's a broad street in Lagos whereby uh, that today, if you get to Broad Street, you you kind of find you you kind of move easily because of the crowd. But during the lockdown, there was absolutely no movement because uh, there's a huge restriction from going from one place to the other. So the major, the Broad Street that used to be crowded before became empty due to the lockdown uh, in Lagos. Okay. Um, here you have, like the speakers in the in the previous uh, presentations, people were not people don't even have a clue about how to stop COVID, how people get infected with COVID. Then news flying from one area or the other that you can get infected by touching a place. Then the government interaction, they were fumigating parks, they were fumigating markets. Like this is Yaba Market, is a popular market in Lagos. So here you have the BRT, which is uh, a BRT segment of the uh, terminal of Yaba Market being fumigated by the government, Lagos State government precisely, just to keep Lagos clean before opening, uh, really, uh, allowing people to come out gradually to their workplace. So the government officials fumigating Yaba Market. This is quite interesting because when the information got to the people that you have to use face masks as one of the preventive measures to, to prevent yourself from uh, getting COVID. Uh, the medical face mask, the, uh, the medical face mask was, uh, was not available because it became scarce. And the price tripled, not tripled, the price went from maybe a, a 50 cents, went to about $400 per one. And it was difficult for people to get. And uh, all of a sudden, around, the, the young men, women, they went into, uh, into the, uh, their stores to get uh, local made fabric, start creating local made fabric in form of face masks. So if they cannot get the medical face masks, they were able to provide the, the uh, local made fabric in face mask form so that motorists can use, because only the people that were around were those essential workers, the journalists, the medical, those involved with food, those in the medical, AF field were allowed to move at, at, the, at the during the lock, lockdown stages uh, in here in this image I tagged the word under under face max so you have the government came up with a uh, restriction that if you have to come out to do your business you have to be on face max so it was a new business for uh, most Nigerians which up to date people still sell face max in some areas in, from, in, in the place of eateries, restaurants, banks, you have people selling face masks. But uh, in traffic, you still have them. So I tell this that the word is on the face mask so because without face masks, you can't move from point A to point B in Lagos and other parts of the country. Wow, wow, wow. Very amazing day. Thank you for your brilliant um, presentation. Thank you. I have Thank you very much. one question for you. I have one question for you, which is very brief. Uh, what is the situation in your country now as compared to the early days of COVID? Uh, to be honest, it's a bit down where, where there's COVID. Not, we're not in denial that there's no COVID. I, caught, I had COVID at a particular time. And uh, we we... They, we have uh, we we stick with the government uh, and the uh, government's rules of engagement at the early stage, whereby we were we're not sure you have a face mask or sometimes we go around using gloves and the rest of them. But now in the country, 
it's it's uh it's about ten percent. It is not it's not serious. It's not serious the way it used to be. Uh, COVID is a bit going down for us because we know it has come, it's here to stay. So all we just need to do is to um, know how to go about it. So the information about COVID and how to go about COVID is everywhere. The government in this part, the with the private help of the private sector, they actually formed the campaign to the local government, to the rural area about COVID. But now we're good. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... The panelists, I have one question for all of you uh, before we open our doors to questions from the other uh, participants who are here with us. Uh, just to uh, know from you, what is that memory that, that particular um, uh, memory that would not escape your mind? during this COVID as you are working? What is that thing that will not run away from your mind, even in the next 10 to 15 years, covering the pandemic? Yusuf, I think okay. I should begin with you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madora. Um, it was so shocking when I lose a friend who died with his wife and children. I cannot explain to you at this particular moment because when I think about it, this guy just died like this. When we get the information that he was admitted, he died at the hospital in the toilet. When he went to the to rest room, he died inside the rest room. And when the wife got the information that the husband died in the rest room, she was shocked and died also. Um, their baby also died because the wife was shocked. Uh, the, the, the one I actually put to uh, there is the one my younger sister was asking me, well, why do I come to visit my mother when I had COVID? <laughs> so I'm not holding that. I guess she's part of the participants. I'm not holding you, Kang Day. But I was shocked that uh, my, my family could have just said, look, don't come and visit. Don't. Uh, in Buddha, I said, I've been tested uh, negative after uh, taking all the treatment. You know, when you go around as a photojournalist view at that time, you can drive around Lagos without traffic. So I was able to stop by to just say hello to the, to the house. And the next thing, my younger, younger sister said to me, why did you come? You could have just called. I said, I'm free. He said, no, the last time we had a view is that you had COVID. So why are you coming to, to see her? I've not seen her for months. Let me just say hello. It's like I was chased out of the house. Um, for not saying so, but I didn't have a close friend. I didn't have a close friend like uh, Yusuf who died of COVID. But I know some other people, notable people, who died of COVID in the course of the uh, in the course of COVID. So that's my take. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, uh, yes, maybe I found something bright, uh, and I, I would like to talk about the bright. Uh, uh, image that I found in parallel with the uncertainty and the fear, uh, there was always there were always uh, people coming together, and uh, I can say that uh, I can go to the point that families could get to know each other more than before that pandemic. Uh, I mean that uh, everybody everybody uh, gave more time to their kids, to their mothers, to their fathers, uh, something that was not happening in the past. That was going on in parallel with the fear, with, in parallel with, uh, with the lockdown or maybe the lockdown caused that, I don't know. Uh, it, was, it was really bright and uh, nice. Thing. I, I, I agree like what Salah said. Actually, on my perspective is, we can really see, I think it's same to all, or, I mean, all of you, because it's this pandemic and this COVID thing make 
some people go like broke and kill themselves and some people i mean instead of they are really being i mean in their covid they have been with the disease. I mean, in terms of like business side or any other than that, that people lost their job. And some of the other than that, in the other way is some people can become millionaires as well during this pandemic when they're selling the face mask and all. So it's like turn around in this world, you can really see, I mean, in, in, in my perspective on that, it's like more on the business side where people lost their job and people say that they, I mean, they don't have a job. And some other people can really make money during this pandemic, and some other millionaire also born during this pandemic. So it's something like you know, it's it's something that we can really see and witness this, witness this, you know, for these two years of pandemic. So yeah, that, that is my perspective. It's like both both thing. Uh, some lost their job, some become millionaire during this. It's like. Check, yeah, check on balance or something. I don't know how to explain it, but that is my perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question in the chat, uh, uh, which uh, is addressed to all the panelists. Uh, to all the panelists, it's coming from Richard Aline. He says that uh, your role in documenting the situation in your home country is clear. How did how did you see your role in keeping citizens informed to reduce suspicion and combat misinformation and disinformation? Can I kind of tag on to that question? Uh, there was a question directed at Yusuf earlier. How effective has a visual media been at educating the public? specifically in Guyana, in Guyana, but but in all of your countries. So it sort of fits into that question. Yes, anybody can start. May I? Sure. In one of my photos that I, I had um, uh, no time to reach out to, uh, there was a village that I went to they did not, uh, they already could not receive the internet signal. After that time, uh, they started to uh, learn uh, online or to, to, to uh, they started to stop going to the schools and uh, teaching was only online. So those people in, in this village and other places did not have internet. So. Uh, there was a role of the media here at this point, for example, to, to show that there's a problem. You have decided as a, as a government to, uh, to win in a point, but you lost in another point. In, in, in our own space, like every other panelist that we have, the, we have several information, uh, someone yeah. saying that yeah, you yeah. need to use uh, salt water to, you have to take salt water. Uh, if you go out, you have to come back, use salt water to take your bed to, uh, to avoid uh, the COVID. Then when we go out, yes, we will send out images to the, media, to the media house. They will publish it. And then you have a lot of media at that time going online because people cannot go out there and start picking up print, the app cover. Like my uh, media house these days, uh, uh, went online. So it's easier for people to be in their living room since uh, they're not going out to see information. This they actually started giving out uh, information on the uh, free e-copy at that time. So when we publish, we send by the, uh, the MTN network, uh, we're able to actually pass this message to the people so that they can actually know the, what the right information is, not the information, the social media. Somebody just cook up one theory uh, space and just send it because he or she has uh, millions of followers without any backing. So people rely on the mainstream newspapers uh, to get the right information. So what we do with our images was to send the images to the newspaper and uh, and they pass it on. So uh, which is uh, basic what the media has carried out. Sure. So our images were able to use to pass the right information in that period until date. 
Okay. So that's from, yeah. How to say here in my place in Malaysia. Uh, that's why like on my side, I'll focus more on the photo essay or documentary, but not like long-term one because that kind of thing is, because you know that pandemic everywhere in the world, all the, our, 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 our jokes, we will go out every day, right? We will see that every day. You go to the hospital, definitely you will get some story and photos. You go on the street, also definitely you will get some stories and photos. It's just on how you're going to make it a little bit, I don't want to say a little bit different, maybe more on you want to do some story, you want to raise some voice that can be speak one. So that, that's how effective as I think is as long as we go and we're very honest with my our work, then definitely the voice will be heard out. So yeah, I think in Malaysia, how effective the visual produce based on how honest we are on the story that we develop. Yeah, it's just that. Okay, thank you. Um, Manamo, may I bump in here? Uh, Yusuf had answered the question and he is having problems, but he wrote it is not that the visual is not an is not effective because of financial constraints during the pandemic and the lockdown bringing almost everything down only few media were involved about 15 journalists were sick with COVID during interviews. Most of the frontline journalists were sick with COVID and admitted. Most of the journalists from the, the hospital were explaining the way we're feeling. All this made journalists very scared. Wow. That was his response. We, uh, Bunny uh, Brittany is like we are running uh, yeah. against our time. So uh, it's all been nice from this end. Over to you next door. Thank you so much, Manuel. We really appreciate the work. And thank you, Emmanuel, for being back up as needed. And thank you so much to the audience for your thoughtful questions, for listening, for being part of, and for bearing witness to this incredible journey. You know, I always have the feeling at the end of this, little in history have we, little have we ever been so united as divided as we are, little have we ever been so united. So thank you for sharing your talents and your stories and your history with us. And with that, I will pass it over to Britt. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you for your questions. They, are, they added such depth to the exchange. So glad friends and family could come. And for those of you who are not in the program, the event will now end. And for our visitors, if you could stay a few more minutes, we'll go over some announcements for June. Thanks everyone.